Hello, my name's Gary Barlow and thanks for downloading this very special podcast. It's called We Write the Songs and what happens is that we delve deep into the witchcraft of building a magic song. I'm going to be chatting to the best in the business about how they write those masterpieces. It's going to be pretty special. You have to jump and leave your life behind in order to dedicate yourself to being a musician. Kenny Everett came to the launch and stole one of the tapes. He took it, he stole the Bohemian Rhapsody tape because he loved it and played it on the radio before it, actually it was finished. I was actually singing I Don't Believe in Queen anymore, just want to be me because I wanted to escape. I am sitting here about to chat to a complete legend. My guest was the guitarist in the epic rock band Queen and wrote some of their biggest hits from We Will Rock You to I Want It All. He's been at the top of his game for over 50 years and clocked up over 300 million album sales. And there's even more to come in 2022. Brian May, you are a songwriting master and it's such a pleasure to have you here on We Write The Song. So welcome. Thank you, Gary. What a wonderful introduction. <laughs> it's a much shorter version than how I started, believe me. So uh, Thank you. Now, Brian, we, we talk about um, the skill of songwriting, but we, we love to know where it all kind of began, I guess. So can, can we take you back to the, the very start of it all and just tell us where music first touched you, I guess? Were, you, were you living in a musical house? Yes. Um... My dad played piano uh, very well, actually, but kind of instinctively. He couldn't read music, and neither can I, basically. I mean, I've tried, <laughs> but basically I'm an instinctive player. Yeah. My dad also played the ukulele, uh, actually the banjolele, a la George Formby, and I still have his banjolele, which has a picture of George Formby at the top of the headstock. And he carried it all through the war and entertained his troops wherever he was. So he, My dad definitely was a musician, um, but gave it all up when he had a baby on the way and he was coming out of the, the forces and he had a mortgage on a house. He just said, because we talked about it much later, he said, I couldn't. He said, I had to make that choice. I had to put my family first. Huh. So that's the background for me much later making the opposite decision, I suppose, that I had to go out and, and, and become a musician in spite of it kind of wrecking everything else. Because that's yes. kind of the way it goes, isn't it, really? You know, you have to jump uh, and leave your life behind in order to dedicate yourself to being a musician. And um, there's kind of no way back. <laughs> yeah. So I might, might, I'm cutting a lot of stuff out here, but jumping to the time when I lost my dad, my dad died very young at 66. And we'd had a very tough time because he didn't approve of me going off and being a rock star for a long time. He thought I'd throw my life away. And only in those last days when we both knew he was about to go did we really get to the bottom of everything. And he said, I think I always uh, had a regret inside me that I didn't go off and make my music, and you did. So there was always a kind of barrier there. I couldn't accept it. Um, and I said, Dad, by doing what you did, you enabled me to do what I did. And he kind of took that on board and <laughs> we actually hugged, which was odd because we don't, <laughs> my dad's generation didn't really hug that much. They they shook hands even in within the family. So mm -hmm. for me and my dad to hug on that was a good, <laughs> a good result, if you like. So we made our peace before he went. Um, and he did understand that I had to do that. I had to follow the call, as I'm sure you did. You know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Jumping into music, you don't put a toe in. Mm. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's ever been successful just putting a toe in. You have to wholeheartedly commit everything. You do. There's a famous saying, and I'm going to misquote it, I'm sure, and I don't even know who it's from. Maybe somebody can tell me, but it says, no man ever reached the farther shore without losing sight of the home shore. Mm. That's, I'm sure that's a misquote, but it's it's very true. You have to let go. You have yes. to say to yourself, well, maybe I will never come back, but I have to make this journey. Yeah, yeah. So, Brian, before we get to Queen, let's just try and get into your head a little bit more as a, as, as a, a, in those teenage years. What were you listening to? What were you being inspired by at that point? Ah, uh, 
<laughs> well, we were. You see, I'm a bit older than you, Gary. Um, it was a strange time for us. I was born in 1947, and that's just before the 50s happened. And the 1950s were just an explosion in social and musical terms, especially musical. And suddenly, on the airwaves, were things like Little Richard screaming his head off in a way which nobody ever, ever had done before. You know, speaking his pain and his frustration and his excitement, his sexuality. I first heard Little Richard on a friend's record player. I had a, I had a little mate. I'm about seven years old, eight years old or something. I'm around my friend's house and his big sister has a record player. She's playing Little Richard and I heard it coming through from upstairs. It's like, whoa, what is that? <laughs> you know, what's yeah. he singing about? What is that? Why Why does that make me feel some kind of something in my in my insides? <laughs> What you doing to me? So, Brian, tell me, I love this. Tell us about the Red Special. Well, my dad taught me everything and, and worked with me and everything. He was an amazing dad. And um, I wanted a guitar. As soon as I heard this stuff, I wanted to play like Hank Marvin and nice. Buddy Holly and all those things. But I couldn't afford it. We were a very poor family. My mum used to save shillings and sixpences for the gas meter and the electric meter and everything. And when they ran out we were cold um mm -hmm. so to ask my mum and dad for a guitar was kind of impossible i couldn't afford the fender or the gibson i couldn't yeah. afford the english copies of the the fenders and gibson like the selmers and stuff so what do we do we say we're going to make a guitar <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened and wow. i had a lot of stuff in my head kind of a vision of what i wanted it to do and what it what I wanted it to look like, etc. My dad had the technical backup, and he, I guess he used this whole thing. We probably worked on it for two years in our spare bedroom, which was my dad's workshop, and he taught me how to use the plane and the saw, the sandpaper, all the tools, all hand tools, um, no electric tools whatsoever, but we fashioned a guitar out of bits and pieces, piece of an old fireplace, uh, mahogany, beautiful 100-year-old mahogany, nearly 200 years old now, by the time I pop off. <laughs> yep. And a piece of an oak table, piece of my mum, like my mum's knitting needle to put the top on the tremolo. I made the tremolo out of um, <laughs> bit, a piece of mild steel that I found lying around that, that I filed out and some motorbike valve springs to balance the tension and it became my instrument. I wanted it to sing. I wanted it, the guitar to be sure. my voice, even in those days. Where, where does the songwriter arrive from this point and why? Why the desire to write your own songs? You know, that's much more difficult. Uh, and I don't often get asked that question. So it's interesting to look at that. I don't think I've ever regarded myself as a songwriter as such. Um, because I suppose it, it's not a controllable thing in me. I can't always do it. I can do it if I'm presented with a challenge or if I have a strong feeling about something in my life. But most days when I get up, if people said to me, OK, write a song now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to because I wouldn't have that thing. I wouldn't have the flame burning. Certain times I have. The very first things I wrote were with Tim Staffel, who was my singer in Smile. That's the, that's the group mm -hmm. that preceded Queen. Yes. It was Tim Staffel and me and Roger Taylor, my, my brother and drummer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Tim and I wrote, we had a couple of attempts at things. One was doing all right, um, where will I be this time tomorrow, yeah. etc., which landed up actually on the first Queen album, a different version. But me and Tim wrote that together just because we felt like it. Um, I also wrote a song called Step On Me, which I think is just me. I think that's the beginning of me realizing that everything I write comes from my own experience and my own sure. feelings so I might be writing about uh, a story in a film like in Highlander much later on 
But the impetus is coming from what I feel inside, from my relationships and my hopes and fears and disappointments and joys. Um, so that's the kind of songwriter I am, I think. I can't write unless I have that kind of emotional drive inside. I can't fake it, if you like. No, no, exactly. It's it's an emo emotional thing and it and arrives mm. when, you, when you need it and, and uh, it's, yeah. it's something that can't be forced. You know, at the heart of all of this that we talk about, it, it it's you emptying your heart for, mm. you know, almost like, am I any good, sort of. <laughs> it's one of those. Yeah, yeah. It's a scary thing, right? Yes, I think so. You have to expose your vulnerability to do it, don't you? Yes. So, Brian, this is obviously the the big bit that everyone's interested in, is, is when you eventually, the Queen, the band come together you know, just give us a little quip of, of how, you know, did, did you know when everyone was in the room, this is going to be something great? Just talk us through how that all just happened. Oh, yeah. Um, I think me and Rog had a, a kind of shared vision from way back when, from when we first met in the jazz club room in Imperial College. And as soon as we started playing together, there was something. It sounds corny, but there was a kind of magic that happened in there, strangely enough. And it still happens. If he starts hitting his drums and I start playing, it sounds like us. It has a sort of completeness to it. It's like a, a machine where all the, the cogs fit together. Mm -hmm. So there's me and Rog there, but uh, we started off with Tim Staffel as, as our singer in Smile. But that all broke up. And along came Freddie. And Freddie was this big unknown, very flamboyant character, but full of kind of paradoxes because he was a very shy boy, really. But at the same time, his behavior was very much like a peacock. He was very outgoing and he behaved like a rock star when he wasn't. You know, long before he was a rock star, he was running around being Robert Plant, you know. <laughs> um, so we got together with Freddie with really no idea whether he could sing or not. And in the beginning, he couldn't sing that well. He had a voice, but he didn't have the equipment to use it. Very quickly, he found out how. And it happened when we went in the studio. We, did, we were lucky enough to go in and do some demos. And Freddie, for the first time, heard himself coming back off tape, and he hated it. He was like, I'm not, I'm not putting it out like that. I'm doing that again. No, that's not good enough. I'm doing that again. And he would go back and back and back until he got what he wanted. Um, so there's Freddie... And we tried to find bass players, and it was very difficult to find the person who fitted in. I think we were three very p strong personalities, and people who came in who who didn't <laughs> appreciate what we were just didn't fit. There was a sort of mismatch. And then suddenly, one day, in walks John Deacon, who's a friend of a friend, and it just happened. We never even questioned it. We didn't audition him. He just played with us, and we thought, yeah, fine. That's perfect. <laughs> he just had had what it took. So I think that's the moment. That was your question, wasn't it? When is the moment when we knew we had it? I think that when John was in there and we started to routine new songs, mm -hmm. writing and rehearsing, because we said, look, we're not going to go back out and play pubs and clubs and have nobody listening to us. We are going to rehearse, get ready, the songs, um, the production, the equipment, and when the when the knock on the door comes, we're going to be ready. We'll be ready with an act and a band which is able to go out and function. And it's an interesting, even what you're talking about here, the order of things is very interesting because it's not like today in the way that you're writing, recording, shaping your sound and also creating a live show at the same time. This was all done as one thought, right? Yeah, and a lot of credit to Freddie because he was very much into presentation. He was an artist, a graphic artist, and I remember him saying, you know, this band is great. And he used to watch me and Rod playing in the other band, and he loved it. He said we had great musicianship and stuff, and he said, but you don't do anything. You know, you don't put it out there. He, I remember him saying, we have to give them everything. We have to be an act. So it starts right here. And it is about visuals, and it's about being dramatic. It's about making the best use of your body and your facial expressions, your clothes, your lights, your sound, the whole thing. And that became kind of our mantra, which was very unpopular at the time. That wasn't really the way people were. Like serious rock bands didn't do that. 
Was there a, a typical day uh, in a Queen session? Was there specific songwriting duties or was it whatever anybody brought in on the day or came up with? Well, generally, we would book some uh, studio time. You know, it's time to make the album. We've been out on the road nine months. We'll spend the next three months making an album and then we'll go out for another nine months. That's kind of how it worked. So comes the day when we bowl into the studio, we all look at each other and go, well, what you got? <laughs> that was yeah. kind of it really so yeah. we all start playing little bits and pieces to each other and people go oh, okay that sounds interesting I'm sure you've been through similar things it actually makes you very nervous because you feel very insecure about what you might have to bring to the yeah. table and you know that your fellow band members are going to hack it to pieces <laughs> and put their own stamp on it but that's the price you pay because if you're a solo artist you get your own way but if you're in a band you bring your thing in your uh, your template, if you like, the the embryo song, mm -hmm. and you put it in the middle of the table and everybody then piles in and it becomes a group creation. Yes. Uh, so you lose your baby, in a sense, but you gain uh, the adult song, perhaps, if you're lucky. <laughs> I just have to come on to this particular track just because I, I think it would probably be in most people's top five favourite songs just tell us what it was like, Brian, sat at the mixing desk listening to the finished Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm. You know, this, I mean, it must have been a... Did it feel like you had something special right there? Yeah, it did, but I don't think we had time to stop and think about it because we were trying to finish the whole album. We very much made albums rather than singles, and it was an immensely complex album. And we had a launch party before it was finished, actually. <laughs> which is a bit rash, but it's just the way it worked. We were working at three studios, in, in three studios at once and trying to finish off the last pieces. And I remember Kenny Everett came to the launch, famous uh, Capital Radio DJ came to the launch and stole one of the tapes. He took it, he stole the Bohemian Rhapsody tape because he loved it and played it on the radio before it, actually it was finished. Wow. Um, I remember waking up next next morning he also stole the prophet song which really wasn't finished at all and i remember hearing it on my neighbor's radio and thinking oh my <laughs> god that's leaked out and it's not even mixed properly i mean the rhapsody tape was as close as anything mixed you know it wasn't mastered but yeah and of course i didn't write bohemian rhapsody um now let me think who did um yes young freddie mercury wrote that yeah, and yeah. i think it's a wonderful creation yes and of course like we, we were talking earlier we all pitched in and of course we contributed lots of stuff but that was his vision in his head which we were realizing and um you know funny thing is it wasn't as shocking as perhaps you might think because we'd kind of gone into that ter territory anyway even on the very first album um uh, there's things like my fairy king we'd done a lot of very complex piano based things with lots of harmonies not so dissimilar from bohemian rhapsody a lot of people have moments in music, but there's very few moments, very few of live events where you go, I remember when I, where I was when I saw that, and I, we just have to just brush on your performance at Live Aid. Were you in the dressing room going, let's steal the show, or was it just, did the emotion of the <laughs> audience just take, take, it, take you off to another place? No, we didn't say let's steal the show. It was more like... Can we get away with this? <laughs> you know, oh, oh, no. No, it's more like, you know, <laughs> have we worked hard enough? Are we up to this? No, it was, it was an immense challenge. But there was also this great feeling that everything was going to be all right. It was a wonderful feeling backstage at Live It. Everyone genuinely was there for the right reasons. Nobody was kind of jockeying for position. There was no argument about who goes on first and all that sort of stuff that you normally get at festivals. No, everyone just said, look, we'll do whatever Bob tells us. Bob Geldof being the great guru who put this all together. And Bob had said to us, don't get clever. Just go on there and play the hits. Don't yeah. do any, this is a global jukebox. Everyone wants to hear the stuff they know and smile. Don't try and do anything except be a, a hit machine on there. So we did, we put our little show together, which was a, an amalgamation of, of a lot of our biggest tracks. Uh, what you, I suppose you would call it a long medley these days yeah. <laughs> it was all and and we did work we put a, a week's work into putting that little show together and of course we knew as it says in the bohemian rhapsody movie there's there's a lot of truth in that movie 
all those tickets for Live Aid had been sold before we were announced. So nobody mm. bought tickets thinking they were going to see us. So when you think about that, you're not going on to an audience which is uh, your audience. You're not preaching yes. to the converted. It was a complete unknown. We were walking into a into a completely unknown area. And it was astonishing to us when we got to Gaga that everybody knew what to do with the hand claps and everything. You know, that's suddenly that I realized that's the power of the video. You, you could see, you know, that we had a video out there. Everybody would seen it. They knew what was expected. And the whole place became a queen audience. So we, we never could have taken that for granted. And Freddie, Freddie was... Uh, struggling a little bit with his voice by that time you know again you see that in the movie um he was okay but he wasn't in his tip-top state and it was a risk for him to to go for for everything at full pelt and it particularly it was a risk for him to do his hey oh thing yeah you know because he's completely kind of naked there and he's pushing things and um he decided he'd go for it <laughs> And it was a great decision, I think, because even though you hear little cracks in his voice, you hear the passion and commitment. And yeah, there's nobody like Freddie. You know, he he just had that thing in his his body which could evoke a response in an audience. I think it's the kind of like the common touch. I think everybody in that audience realised that Freddie had made himself that way, and um, and they could as well. He's he's an inspiring person to see on stage. I think. Ryan, can you just give us a, a couple of words on uh, the show must go on? Is, is hmm. j just r run us through just a little bit of the process of coming up with a song, an anthem like that. W was it very much a case? I'm sure at this point you were playing to stadium after stadium. Was it the sort of thing where you pair a song with a, an event like? Do you imagine it in those venues, or is it just something you come up with and then the audience take it and? accept it as they like well it had been like that but of course by the time we get to the show must go on we're not touring anymore oh. freddie's not well and we don't know if we don't know how how bad it's going to get mm -hmm. i think we suspect that it might be the the worst but we don't dare even accept it so i'm writing this song in the knowledge that we may never get to to play it in a stadium. Nevertheless, I do have that vision in my mind. You're right, I do have that. Um, Freddie's pretty bad by this time, and he can come in for a couple of hours a day, but then he gets really tired and he has to go off and get his treatments and stuff. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't know where the chorus line came from. It just popped into my head for some reason, playing around with chords and stuff. That sequence, there's a sort of circular chord sequence which underlies it. Uh, which goes ding 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 that line against a number of different chords, and it was one of these things that obsesses your head. I don't know if you get things going round in your head again and again. So for days, weeks, I had this sequence going round, and gradually got the idea that it ought to be about this clown who's feeling pain and sadness, but he always has to paint his smile on because that's what he is. He's a person who brings people joy. So I had this idea, and I went in, laid down the basic idea, and played it to Freddie. And I said, as I often did, I think, to Freddie, look, this might be a bit corny. I'm not sure if this is going to work, you know. And he said, well, what's it, what's it going to be called? And I said, well, I think it could be called The Show Must Go On, but maybe that's too corny. And as well. he says, no, darling, it's not too corny. Let's get on with it. <laughs> and, and then I explained the clown thing. Now, it's a bit odd because we both know that he probably doesn't have long to go. Right. And it's kind of obvious that it's a metaphor for what Freddie actually is because he's putting a brave face on everything. He's doing his fantastic weaving his magic, even though inside he's falling apart. But we never talked about it. It just wasn't right. We we talked about the clown and how he felt and how he was painting his smile on and and where that all was. So I sat down with Freddie for probably an hour and a half and we hammered out the words for a single verse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Empty spaces. What are we looking for? Abandoned places. I guess we know the score. And then he said, Brian, I'm tired. I have to go and I have to get my treatment and stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll return to this later. Well, he didn't return for weeks. And I woke up one morning with this idea in my head about the, the wings of butterflies. I thought, this is perfect, and I want to hear Freddie sing this. Demoed it, played it to him. He loved it, did it. 
and that was, I suppose, the final song ingredient. But there was a massive amount of production, if you like, that goes into it, I suppose. Yes. And yes. Freddie had to sing the extra bits that I'd written. So I, it's all written down on pieces of paper. And the last verse goes ridiculously high, and I demoed it falsetto because I can't sing very high. Um, I can fly, my friends. And I went to Freddie, I don't know if you can do this full voice because it's going to hurt you because he always said, oh, you bloody hurt my voice, Brian. <laughs> yeah. And Freddie looked at it and listened to it and picked up a glass of his favourite vodka and said, oh, do it. <laughs> Downed the vodka, leaned on the on the mixing desk where he sang in the latter days. He didn't go in the studio. He just sang in the studio. And he nailed it. And I think wow. he did three takes. And it's extraordinary, that last verse. It's, it goes right into the stratosphere. And that was a divine moment for me. I just thought, my God, he's nailed it in a way that I never even thought he could. And then I demoed the harmonies, like, go on, go on, go on at the end. F again, Freddie was tired and he said, oh, look, it's really nice what you've done at the end. Can't you just keep it that way so that I don't have to sing? <laughs> so, so that's what it is. This go on stuff is just me sort of demoing it. I just chose chose one of your many hits there, and to hear, you know, you've pretty you've pretty much linked up everything we've talked about in the interview. The fact that there's so much content emotionally within that song, and the amount of time it took you to put those pieces together, um, that's the mind of a mathematician and someone who's moved greatly by music and people and uh, observing situations. It, it's a that's a wonderful description of 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 a pe a piece of music and and the detail and the heart that goes into it. So thank you so much for that. Well, thanks, Gary. So Brian, you touched on it earlier, but um, you you have a friend who who tragically dies, uh, a, a friend you've lost. As a songwriter, as a musician, how how do you get over that? Is mu is music a help, a hindrance? How how do you work past something like that? Ah, uh, losing Freddie. Well, it's immensely complicated. I think it's it's not a it's not a smooth curve of recovery. It's all sorts of unwelcome and seemingly inappropriate emotions that you get. It's like when you lose a family member. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've lost both my parents. I haven't lost a sibling because I don't have any. So Freddie was probably the closest thing to a sibling I've ever had. Um, it's hell. It's horrible, and you feel angry and. Kind of disappointed and you feel all sorts of weird emotions but it went the grieving process for for me and I know for Roger went on for a long time and I think we but we went into denial I think that's what happened it's like we thought well you know this never really happened and we did Queen but that's that's all right that's over now and we just we're just musicians and we do our thing you know I don't want to talk about Queen don't want to talk about Freddie um, we're moving on now what was going on inside was I'm in pain and I can't look at this. So I went out and did two world tours on my own, singing in front of a band, the Brian May Band. It's a bit foolhardy, really, because I'm not a singer, <laughs> really. Um, but that's the way I worked through it, I suppose. And I remember I went so far as to, to sing the John Lennon song, you know. I don't know if you remember, uh, it's called God. But in the course of it, he says, I, I don't believe in Beatles anymore. And I, I was actually saying, I don't believe in Queen anymore. I just want to be me because I wanted to escape. That was a genuine thing. Um, looking back, I think, poor sod, <laughs> you know, you were protesting too much and that wasn't what was in your heart. Mm -hmm. So there came the time when Roger and I decided we would go back in and do the the final Queen album with all the bits that we had left of Freddie's vocal. And that was a real painful experience but also incredibly joyful because you're yes. suddenly retrieving all these wonderful gems that seem like they've been lost at the bottom of the ocean and you're polishing them up finishing them making them into something wonderful for eternity so i think the album that we made after freddie went made in heaven album is probably the best we ever made because it's just so f saturated with everything that we worked for all the all the passion all the pain and um all the joy, it's all in there. And we were able to do it because of the wonderful little snippets that Freddie left us, in full knowledge that we would be able to finish those songs. 
Now, Brian, you've got a, an album out. Can you tell oh. us what that is? We're all looking forward to it. I've had the pleasure of listening to it all week. Ah, yes, thanks. It's called Another World, and it's my second solo album, created at a time pretty much like what we've been talking about when I'm still yeah. getting over the fact that Freddie isn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, but the music was a saviour. I found I could go in there, emote, put it down on tape. I trained myself to be a singer. Uh, I pushed myself as hard as I could possibly possibly push, partly out of curiosity to see how far I could go, partly because I needed it to... I didn't have Freddie anymore. I had to be that vehicle. We're talking about 25 years ago. I've, I've been back in and remastered it. I didn't remix a single note because I think the mix is a part of the magic mm-hmm. in, the, in the moment. But we've remastered it, and we've found a lot of outtakes and bits and pieces that I did relative... That, that were connected um so it's one of these box sets where you've you've got some extra things to to listen Maybe. to and some some memorabilia the first thing will be um on my way up which is a kind of anthem about belief in yourself of which i didn't have you know it's funny we've been queen we've been a, all around the world we've been very successful etc but me as a solo artist is a different matter i felt very insecure and i'm telling myself it's going to be okay. I'm going to get through. I'm going to get to the next place where I'm going to be joyful. So, am I right in thinking the first time around it was out on cassette and vinyl, but it's never been on streaming services? Definitely never been on streaming. No, you can't get it anywhere. That, that's all my solo stuff. I suddenly realised that last year, sometime or year before last, during pandemic time, that you can't get my solo music anywhere. Okay, okay. You know, I do Instagram like you do, and you know, you can go into stories and and paste a a piece of music on. Well, I couldn't paste my own music on because I couldn't find it. That's kind of what led me to thinking, I must put this stuff out in, in a form which makes sense in 2020, whatever it is now. <laughs> Brian, it's a good time for me to ask this. We ask everybody at the end of each show, but if there's something, because we have a lot of songwriters that listen to this, if there's anything you've learned across the years where you think that's one piece, great piece of advice for a young up-and-coming songwriter, what what would that be? Ooh, um, capture the moment, I think, would mm. be my advice. Because these things come to you, don't they, like little birds that fly into your brain, but they fly out again unless you grab them. <laughs> so all through my sort of writing life, I've always carried a little tape recorder around with me. In in the early days, it was a Philips thing about this size, with a, like a brick. Now everybody's got a, a sound recorder in their phone. Of course, every iPhone has a sound recorder. So if the idea comes into your head, um, sing it into the tape recorder because it may never come back and even if it comes back it may not come back the way it originally came to you so those are precious things i would say grab them and guard them with your life because those are the seeds of your songs you know we spoke to christine mcvee and she talked about waking up in the middle of the night with songbird but didn't have anything to record it with so so kept herself up till the sound engineer came in at 9 a.m in the morning wow (laughs) interesting very interesting do you do that you do the same stuff I, I'm with I'm with you. I I do a voice note straight away because I can hear the chords and some of the voicings as well, which I'm sure you can. Yeah, you sing that in as well. So you yeah, sing. You know what the bass line's going to be. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Well, I'm the same. When I start, I I talk about make friends with it, live with it, put your mm. arm around it, have a chat with it. You know, yeah. spend time with it. Spend time in that moment with it and yes. try not to make a cup of tea or take a phone call or just, just live there with it and yeah. see what happens. <laughs> yeah, where does this stuff come from? That's the, It's still the great mystery, isn't it? Because we don't really know. Oh, it's brilliant. But Brian, it's been absolutely... We've taken up far too much of your time. So It's a great pleasure, Gary, really. It's brilliant, so thank you. Thank you, Gary. God bless. Oh.